In 16.3, we're going to start to dive into the second and third laws of thermodynamics. And so here's your learning outcomes expectations. Feel free to pause and read through those. So in chapter 16, we, we've gone on this journey from defining spontaneity and non-spontaneity. Will it happen? Will it not happen? And then we, 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 we discovered that enthalpy is not enough to make that prediction. We need another term called entropy, and entropy is thought of as the order or disorder in the system. And now in 16.3, we're going to really get to the heart of this, this idea of thermodynamics and why it's so useful in making predictions about whether things will happen or not. And so like we said, there's the four laws of thermodynamics. We covered chapter 5, which is the zeroth law and the first law. Uh, basically defining temperature and then uh, heat exchange, energy is not created or destroyed. And so now in chapter 16, this particularly in 16.3 and beyond, we're going to dive into these second and third laws of thermodynamics. And so second law is really the heart of deciding whether something's going to happen or not, or predicting whether something will happen. And so the second th law, at least in the context of chemistry, all spontaneous change cause an increase in total entropy of the universe. As in for a process that occurs, or if a process occurs, it occurs because the total entropy of the universe has increased. And so we can define this in terms of, of, of entropy numerically, in terms of S universe, that is the entropy of the universe. And we can have a delta s universe which is change in entropy of the universe and so if we want to predict whether something will happen or not we really need this delta s universe number and so delta s just as any other deltas it's basically final minus initial if you know the initial condition of the universe or the initial entropy of the universe and you know the final entropy of the universe you can get a sign associated with this delta s universe and so if the entropy of the final condition is greater than the initial then we have a positive delta s universe as in the entropy of the universe increases the universe becomes more disordered this is a favorable or spontaneous process in contrast if if your entropy of the final condition is less than the initial condition, then you have a negative delta S universe. And this is non-spontaneous. It, it, it basically, for this to occur, the universe would have to become more ordered. And that doesn't happen according to the second law of thermodynamics. And so unlike other things where it's favorable or unfavorable, this is just, this won't happen. This will happen. And that's what's allowed by the second law of thermodynamics. And so as long as you can figure out delta S universe, you can make a prediction about literally anything that could possibly happen. Interestingly, if delta S is equal to zero, the system is already at equilibrium. It's not going to shift uh, to reach that equilibrium. It is already at that equilibrium. And so delta S the universe, like we said, you just need this number right here, delta S universe. So you just need to know the entropy of the final state and entropy of the initial state. Well, it turns out that's hard, right? Because the, the, the known universe is something like 93 billion light years across. And we're trying to figure out the entropy change of the entirety of a system that we can't really measure. And so we can think about our system as, you know, a very small fraction of that and our surroundings as everything else, right? And so if we know what happens in the surroundings and the system, well, then we can start calculating this delta S of the universe. And so we're going to redefine it rather than you know, delta S of the universe final uh, and initial, we're going to define it in terms of delta S universe as in a delta S of the system and delta S of the surroundings. So we've kind of partitioned this. We don't need to know the whole universe and its whole. We need to know what happens to the system and what happens to the surroundings. And so for the sake of our chemistry class, we're going to talk about closed system with a fixed volume that's going to exchange heat. And that's going to be our system. And then everything else is going to be the delta S of the surroundings. And so looking back at this, we have delta S of the system, delta S of the surrounding equals delta S of the universe, right? And so we have system, we have surrounding, we have a boundary between, we have heat being exchanged between those two. And so we can look at what happens uh, as this entropy changes occur, okay? So if we have a positive delta S system and positive delta S surrounding, that means the entropy of the system went up the entropy of the surrounding went up, which means the entropy of the universe will go up. And so if we have a positive delta S system, positive delta S surrounding, it will always be spontaneous. It'll be always positive delta S universe. If we have a negative delta S system, which means the entropy of the system went down, the entropy of the surroundings went down, we have a negative delta S universe. This never happens. It's never spontaneous. It does not occur. 
Now we can have a mix and match condition where we have a entropy of the system goes up, but entropy of the surrounding goes down. Well, this delta S universe could be positive or negative depending on how big this negative positive number is and how small this negative number is. It depends which one wins that battle. Likewise, of negative delta S system, positive delta S surroundings, it could be negative or positive depending on how big these numbers are. If is this more positive than this is negative, then you get a positive value. If this is more negative than this is positive, then you get a negative value. It really depends. And so a condition where a system and surrounding entropy goes up, always spontaneous, one Go, both go down. It's never spontaneous. Uh, whether they go up or down, it depends on the competition between the two. And so something to note about this, and this is uh, something sometimes misunderstood about the second law of thermodynamics, is the entropy of the system can decrease, right? We can have a negative delta S system. As long as this positive delta S surrounding is large enough, this reaction can still be spontaneous. And so it's spontaneous if this, this delta S of surrounding is greater than the delta S of the system. And so you can have a scenario where the entropy of the system goes down, but the entropy of the universe goes up because the entropy of the surrounding went up more. And so it's important to think about those relationships between system and surrounding. And so one example of this, and it, it happens every time you take ice and you melt it or, or, or freeze it, you take liquid water and turn it into solid ice. Um, this is a negative delta, the delta S of the system, right? Because the entropy is decreasing. And so this is a negative delta S system, but the reason this is allowed because the delta S of the surrounding is positive and it's more positive than this is negative, which means the delta S of the universe is positive, which means this process is spontaneous under certain conditions. And so uh, again, we're talking about uh, entropy of the systems versus surroundings in terms of chemical reactions. We talk about the system as being the reaction chamber and the surroundings being everything else, and we're exchanging heat between the two. And so you can think about delta S system, at least in chemistry, in terms of delta S reaction, right? What's actually happening during the reaction. And so just like we did with enthalpy, at least in Gen Chem 1 in Chapter 5, we talked about the standard, standard enthalpy of reaction. Here we can talk about the standard entropy of reaction. And it's basically how much does entropy change during a reaction? And we can calculate this the same way we did enthalpy. Instead, in this case, it's delta S, or entropy of reaction is equal to the enthalpy or, or the entropy of products minus the entropy of reactants. And it's the same equation, but in this case, we're using entropy instead of enthalpy. And so we have this standard entropy times the stoichiometry plus the products times stoichiometry. Plus, uh, and then over here, we have the sum of the reactants times the stoichiometry. And you take products minus reactants. That gives you a delta S of the reaction or delta S of the system. And so just like with enthalpy, we have tabulated values in the back of the book. You can see here is the enthalpy of formation. Here's Gibbs free energy, which we'll get into in the next sections. And then here's the entropy. And so effectively for any given reaction, we can look up a value for A, B, C, and D. We can do products minus reactants, and we can get a delta S for this reaction. So again, note, this is almost identical to how we calculate delta H. The only difference is we're using these entropy values rather than these enthalpy values. And so, so just to give you one example, here's H2 plus O2 giving you H2O. Uh, this is basically burning hydrogen in the presence of oxygen to give you water. We can, we can make a prediction based on what we know about qualitative things, right? We can look at this and say, okay, we have gas molecules over here. We have three gas molecules turning into two liquid molecules. Uh, the phase change is becoming more ordered. The number of molecules is decreasing. I would guess that this is going to be a unfavorable process or a negative delta S, right? The entropy is clearly decreasing in this system. So I should get a negative delta S value. And so I can actually calculate whether that's true or not. Products minus reactants, go to my tabulated values. I can look up H2O, there's the product, there's the two reactants. I can plug those numbers in. A few things to note about this is um, there's your entropy numbers from this tabulated values. You also have to take into account stoichiometry. So here's products, it's H2O. There's the uh, S value goes right there. Two is the stoichiometry. And then here's the two products, stoichiometry of two on H2 and one on O2. And so we go through, calculate that. We get a negative 327.2 joules per Kelvin mole. And in this case, entropy decreases exactly as we would have predicted, right? Gas going to liquid, two, three molecules going to two. Entropy should decrease. And in fact, it does decrease. 
And so one quick note on the, the third law of thermodynamics. So, so second law of thermodynamics for a spontaneous process, entropy of the universe increases. Third law of thermodynamics is basically letting us define what zero is on the entropy scale. And so this is an important frame of reference. Um, it, it basically gives us a baseline for entropy discussion. It says the entropy of a perfect crystalline substance at zero Kelvin is zero. So that's a scenario where S equals zero. So think about a perfect crystalline substance substance, it is perfectly organized, all the atoms are perfectly arranged and they're not vibrating at all because there's no temperature, they are staying perfectly still. That is one possible microstate. And if you do your math, one microstate equals a multiplicity of one, natural log of one is zero, your entropy of this system is zero. And anytime you increase the temperature, anytime you add motion to this, your entropy is going to increase and it's going to go above this zero value. And so this is why we have an absolute entropy scale for substances. This is why you know, you won't see negative entropy, uh, barring any extenuating circumstance, because this is not a like physical reality. It's we don't have a way to get to a perfect crystal with zero Kelvin. Um, instead, this is like a baseline construct that we use to discuss all entropy above this threshold. And coincidentally, if uh, we, we, we look at this in graphical form, we talked about entropy changes during phase changes, entropy changes as temperature increases, we can start with a perfect crystalline substance at, you know, zero Kelvin and that has zero entropy. And so anything we do to this system, like increasing temperature, the entropy increases. Increase temperature, the entropy increases. And then at some point, we'll get to phase transition from a solid to a liquid. And so during that phase transition, the temperature is not changing, but the amount of entropy in the system is. And so as you go from solid to liquid, big change in entropy, and then you're in the liquid form, you keep increasing the temperature, entropy increases, 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 the molecules start moving faster and faster, and eventually they reach a threshold where it's going to boil. It's gonna transition from a liquid to a gas, and that's a huge entropy change, right? You're changing from a relatively ordered liquid to a completely disordered gas big change in entropy, and then you can keep heating up that gas and the molecules will move faster and faster and the entropy will increase. And so this is a summary of both our qualitative phase change, but also quantitative in that we start at zero entropy for a perfect crystalline solid at zero Kelvin, and then temperature increases, phase change increase, temperature increase, phase change increase, so on and so forth. And so, yeah, that's why we can start at zero for a perfect crystalline solid at zero Kelvin, and then we increase the entropy of the system from there. All right, so to summarize, all we need to do to predict whether a process is spontaneous or non-spontaneous is we need to know delta S of the universe. Um, that's what the second the law of thermodynamic tells us. But we don't have to just do delta S of the universe math. We don't have to know the entirety of the universe. We just have to know the delta S of the system and the surroundings. And so if that the, the sum of system and surroundings is positive, this process is spontaneous because delta S universe is positive. And so we can make predictions based on those delta S of systems and surroundings. Um, we can calculate delta S of a system uh, uh, of a particular reaction uh, from the tabulated values. So if we have reactants and products, we simply do delta S is equal to uh, products minus the reactants. And that gives us a delta S for the reaction or a delta S for the system. Um, uh, finally, we close just noting that the third law of thermodynamics basically defines a zero value for the entropy of uh, anything. And it's if you have a perfect crystalline substance at zero Kelvin, the entropy of that system is zero. And so we have this absolute entropy scale, and we can scale everything relative to this zero value. All right, so next we'll define uh, define this, this delta S of the universe in terms of Gibbs free energy, which will give us a much more convenient way to talk about delta S, delta H's in real values defined in terms of the system or the reaction.